This week we come to our final message in our Life Together series, and I have uh, enjoyed putting these messages together, and uh, I pray that you have uh, enjoyed them and that you have gotten something out of them and been able to grow in your faith as a result of them. Uh, This morning uh, we finish up with the idea of communion. Now, I am and always have been a bibliophile. That's not a bad word or the sort of thing that can get you arrested or anything like that. It is quite simply one who has a love and appreciation for books. If you come into my office, whether it's at home or my office here at the church, you will find the walls covered with books. You will find my desk stacked with books. Uh, You will find them piled on nightstands. You will find them lining the walls. You'll find them everywhere. If you find me without a book for very long, and such things are rare, you may want to call an ambulance or a psychiatrist. There's something terribly, woefully wrong. Now, I have continued to read uh, through the years a wide variety of genres, but I often find myself coming back to things which are very familiar, uh, books and authors and writing that I connect to and remind me of places that I've been and things and people that I've seen, things that remind me of my childhood most of the time. And because of this, I find myself returning quite frequently to my literary first love, science fiction and fantasy. Now, among the greats such as Terry Brooks and Isaac Asimov and William Gibson, the grandfather of modern fantasy, J.R.R. Tolkien, stands out as probably my favorite to read. More specifically, his Lord of the Rings trilogy. In this three-volume set, you'll find all the tropes of fantasy fiction that you could ever hope to find. Magical creatures and beings, unusual races, vast landscapes, and an epic quest of good against evil. Yet to me what stands out more than anything is the great friendship and extreme loyalty of the main character and his servant, Frodo Baggins and Samwise Gamgee. Now, as the story begins, Samwise is the gardener of Bag End, which is the home for Frodo Baggins. As his father before him, Samwise continues to serve Frodo's family by taking care of their lawn and their flowers and that sort of thing. But Samwise is a curious fellow, and his curiosity gets the better of him when the wizard Gandalf shows up and tells Frodo of a great evil in the land. Samwise is caught eavesdropping and finds himself moving from gardener to valet for the journey ahead. And along the way, Sam and Frodo develop a friendship that leads them to lean on one another to survive the perils of their quest to distant lands and great dangers. At a certain point, it becomes apparent that the travels have brought these two characters closer together, depending on one another for their lives, but also for their emotional survival as well. The quest is carrying this ring of great evil to a volcanic mountain far from their home. And the power of this ring weighs heavily on Frodo as he carries it. So Frodo carries the ring, and Sam carries Frodo, quite literally, at one point in the story, to alleviate the burden. Their relationship becomes so close that Frodo begins to think of and treat Sam as family. In the end, he leaves his home and sizable fortune to Sam and his wife as he goes off to a place called the Undying Lands, which for Tolkien was symbolic of heaven. Now for me, this relationship between these two characters typifies the idea of communion. Communion, when used in the Christian sense of it, means the sharing or exchanging of intimate thoughts and feelings, especially when the exchange is on a mental or spiritual level, and specifically between the individual and God or an individual and others. It comes from a Latin word that's communis or communio, which means mutual participation, and that's very important. When we think about communion, that we think about the idea of, 
of mutual, both people involved, both parties involved, participating in the action. For Frodo and Sam, their journey was one of mutual participation, if nothing else. Their connection to one another was, to me, a fitting example of what the earliest followers of Jesus lived out. Now, the community of believers that we read about in Acts 2, 42 through 47, and again here as we heard this morning in Acts 4, 32 through 35, was one in heart and mind. I want you to think about that. They were one in heart, one in mind. They were one in their feeling about what they were doing and for one another, and they were one in the way that they thought about those things. I believe that oneness in heart and mind for them found its focus on God. It was because the believer, through the power of the Holy Spirit, found a deep abiding connection to God that they were able to connect to one another. New Testament scholar and Anglican bishop N.T. Wright alludes to this in his book, Simply Christian, when he wrote, God offers us, by the Spirit, a fresh kind of relationship with Himself. And at the same time, a fresh kind of relationship with our neighbors and with the whole of creation. Christian spirituality combines this sense of awe and majesty of God with a sense of of his intimate presence. This hunger for God together is, I believe, part of the catalyst for many of the great movements of the Spirit in the history of Western Christianity and the source of the great movement of God that we have seen around the world in the last few decades. I believe it is also the driving force behind the spiritual movement in those who seek divine presence, but not in the established church. They are the spiritual but not religious group that has sworn off the institution in favor of seeking a personal connection of God privately elsewhere. And yet I believe that they are still in their own way Searching for that communion with one another and with God, whether they want to call it church or not. Historically, the early church is not the only place that we've seen this kind of movement. It was found in fringe groups throughout the history of the church, including the Desert Fathers and Mothers, the Waldensians, the Beguans, the Beggards, the Bruderhof, the Amish, and others down to the Methodist movement of John Wesley in his day, and groups like Fresh Expressions in ours. All through the history of Jesus' followers, there have been those who found connection to one another by their communion, by their mutual participation in life with God through the working of the Holy Spirit in their lives. This was... The catalyst, this was how the classes and bands of early Methodism came to be such a powerful voice and give Methodism its unique flavor and voice was that these people committed in their small class groups and their larger band groups to one another to mutually participate in spiritual life, to mutually participate in their existence together. This was the strength of that, this idea of communion. Of course, one of the first examples that we have for this comes to us from the Gospels themselves. The writer of Luke tells us that Jesus would withdraw to deserted places for prayer. I think by this example, Jesus shows the disciples that prayer requires time devoted to being in the presence of and in communion with God, away from the world around us. 
We need not only time with one another, but we need that communal time where it's just us connecting to God. It's just us in the divine presence. It's not just a passing moment where we throw up a few well-meaning requests about the people and the things that we are worried about in our lives. Prayer is communion, mutual participation in the moment with God. It is a connection, an intense connection to the Creator that calls us into being and sustains us in this life. Interestingly enough, if you look throughout the New Testament, there are 82 times that prayer has mentioned. 58 of those are found in the Gospels, referencing the prayers of Jesus or what he has to say about prayer. Prayer, this communion, com- connection to God, where we not only speak, but we listen, is a central aspect of what it means to be Christian. If we don't have that, if we can't connect in that way, we are missing the point. If we do not make time for that, that communion where we not only speak and say to God, here is where I'm at and here is what is going on, but we listen for the response of God. We wait in the presence of God. We enjoy the presence of God. We have missed something. The writer of Matthew notes that Jesus commended his people to prayer, a spiritual communion with God, but not just any kind of prayer. He gives the disciples a lesson in the Sermon on the Mount when he says, when you pray, don't be like hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners so that people will see them. I assure you, that's the only reward they get. When you pray, go to your room. Shut the door. Pray to your Father who is present in that secret place. Your Father who sees what you do in secret will reward you. When you pray, don't pour out a flood of empty words as the Gentiles do. They think that by saying many words, they'll be heard. Don't be like them because your Father knows what you need before you ask. Jesus ends this discourse on prayer by giving the disciples the model prayer that we use every week called the Lord's Prayer. It's a kind of guide for what is important in prayer. And if you notice in the Lord's Prayer and in what Jesus says about prayer here, it's not about, it's not about our reciting to God a litany of what's going on in our lives and all the things that we are concerned with. That's not that it's a bad thing to do that. That's not that it's a bad thing to say to God, I know that this person is hurting or suffering. Would you bless them? I know that this person is in need. Would you take care of that need? What it's saying is that the more important part to prayer, the more important thing to be focused on, is the connection between you and God in those moments. It is the communion that you experience in those moments where you experience the presence of God. And you allow yourself to be drawn into that. It's a solitary pursuit. We go into a quiet place alone and seek the presence of Abba the Father. Now that doesn't mean that we don't ever pray together. Because we do. We do that every week in worship. But this is a particular type of prayer. This is a personal, communal prayer where the point isn't to be in communion with one another, but to be in communion with God. So empty words and frivolous platitudes become meaningless when our souls are truly laid bare in the presence of the divine. Meister Eckhart writes, If a man has God and has only God, no one can hinder him. Why? Because he has only God. And his intention is toward God alone. And all things become for him nothing but God. In other words, when we truly seek beyond the formulas, beyond the road expressions, to being in the presence of God first, foremost, and above all, we will find ourselves 
changed to being able to see the hand of God in and behind all things. Every experience of life will then have the opportunity to be a God experience because God is the focal point. Yet, This solitary communion with God doesn't limit our communion, our mutual participation in the life of faith with one another, as I've said. If nothing else, it should enhance that. Imagine, if you will, a point on a sheet of paper, a single dot, say here. Now, from that point, countless lines radiate inward toward that point in all directions, from all places. Those lines move in the direction of that dot. Each line is connected to one another by its connection to the dot in the center. If we're all moving in the same direction, and that direction is toward God, from wherever we're at in our spiritual journey, from wherever we find ourselves, we are growing in the same direction. And this spiritual participation that we have with God because of our connection with God, becomes spiritual participation with everyone else. And so in the same way that we have, partic- we have communion with God, we have communion with one another because we're all moving in the same direction toward God. As we look back at Jesus' followers in Acts, we find this as their communion. They were devoted to, to life together, to the apostles' teaching, to the community, to shared meals, to their prayers. They were united and shared everything together. They met in the temple and ate in their homes. They shared food with gladness and simplicity. They praised God and demonstrated God's goodness to everyone. They were one in heart and mind, and they held everything in common. In other words, they experienced this new life in a way of in the way of Jesus as a unified singular expression of faith a way of being with and for one another and God was with them in the midst of it notice what it says about how they reacted how God reacted a sense of awe came over everyone I would say that is the presence of God coming into their midst. God performed wonders and signs through the apostles. And throughout the text of Acts, we see over and over God moving in communion, in mutual partnership with the faithful acts of those who followed Jesus' way. Leading, guiding, restoring, healing, all in communion with one another. All in communion with God. To see the state of this country and the greater church, I think, is a sad commentary on this idea of communion. If anything, it almost seems like we live in days of anti-communion, where the wrong thought might set you on the outs with those you thought were friends and family. When social media gives people a platform to disseminate hate and vitriol to those whom they would not have the courage to speak to about these matters face to face. Where people cannot, will not, even seek to find common ground for fear that they might be seen as weak or compromising. And yet this isn't the only time this has ever happened in history. We have a habit of living into Jorge Santillana's great maxim, those who do not heed the lessons of history are condemned to repeat them. So we find ourselves over and over and over reliving this because we never seem to learn, because human nature never really changes. But all of this reminds me of a sermon by John Wesley. It was called Catholic Spirit. And in it, I think Wesley speaks into his day. But in doing so, he speaks into our day as well. He says, if it be, give me thy hand. I do not mean be of my opinion. You need not, 
I do not expect or desire it. Neither do I mean I will be of your opinion. I cannot. It does not depend on my choice. I can no more think than I can see or hear as I will. Keep your opinion. I, mine, and that as steadily as ever. You do not need even endeavor to come over to me or bring me over to you. I do not desire you to dispute those points or to hear or to speak one word concerning them. Let all opinions alone on one side and the other. Only give me thine hand. In other words, Wesley is saying we don't have to do that. We don't have to be of the same opinion. We don't have to have the same thoughts. I dare say that if we took any two people in this congregation, sat them down, and discussed anything, within a very short period of time, we could find something they disagreed about. Does that mean that they can no longer be in communion with one another? Does that mean that they no longer can connect to one another in any sort of deep and meaningful way? I love my father. He's been a great role model for me in my life. And as I've grown into adulthood, he's been a great friend. And yet we disagree on things all the time. And I have never stopped loving my father. It doesn't matter. Because the connection that we have has nothing to do with whether we agree or disagree connection we have has to do with the fact that he's my father I'm his son in the same way I think the connection that we have to God and to one another is a connection that has nothing to do with our opinions it's a connection that has to do with who we are we are children of God we are part of the kingdom of God we are connected to God by being that, and we are connected to one another by being a part of that. Are we willing to offer our hands to others in communion as we offer our hearts in communion to God, even if we don't agree on everything or anything? Can we truly seek to experience mutual participation in this life between ourselves and God, and our neighbors, and our friends, and our enemies, and anyone else that exists in creation. Let us hope so. Let us pray so. Let us act toward it being so.